Today we're blessed to have with us Ashraf Ibrahim, who his roots are from the East Coast, but in the le- recent years he moved to Southern California with his lovely family, and he is currently serving at Saint uh, Saint Verena the Holy Youth, otherwise known as the Center. And so we're very happy to have Ashraf with us to bless his sermon today. Thank you. Uh, it is my great honor to speak to you today, this uh, eve of Monday, uh, the great and holy Basra. As we know, this Basra has a very special significance for us all because it's the first time we celebrate together physically since 2019, given the pandemic. Of course, in all things, for those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose, there is there is good in that. And we spent Basra last year with our families enjoying the churches and altars in our own homes. Vesca is very special to many people and to our church as a whole. We can see this all around us in how we pray and how the church looks and how we even act toward each other. There's something liturgically different about Vesca. The rhythm is different. We come to church every morning and every evening and all day on Thursday and Friday. Inside the church, things look different with black coverings and services that are outside the altar. Neither the clergy nor the deacons put on their vestments, as if all are bare before God and equal with each other. The altar curtains and doors remain closed. There is no offering of incense. There are no vespers, no matins, no midnight, evening, or morning praises or dexologies. And perhaps most abnormally, there is no celebration of the Eucharist except in its most basic form on Covenant Thursday. The readings are different, with the lectionary drawing from both the Old and the New Testament. There are homilies from the fathers and expositions that we never hear throughout the year. The entire gospel is read, and historically the entire Old Testament was read as well. There is an intense concentration on Christ and his work in the final week of his earthly life. We do not read the normal liturgy of the hours in Magbeya, and instead focus solely on Christ daily and hourly, through the Psalms and the Gospel selections. We replace the usual supplication of Lord have mercy, repeated 41 times with the hymn, Thine is the power, as if we have forgotten our own sufferings and instead take comfort in the suffering of Christ. Even the Gospel themselves testify to the importance of this week. The Gospel of St. John devotes almost half its text to the final week of Christ's life essentially from chapter 12 all the way to the end of the gospel in chapter 21. And almost 30% of the text of the gospel of John is on the last night of Christ's life. The synoptic gospels spend roughly one third of their text on the week of Christ's passion. There's something clearly important and unique that both the church and the gospel writers are emphasizing. There's something going on worth disrupting our entire liturgical cadence, and that is the suffering of the Lord leading up to the cross. Given this context, I would like to spend just a few minutes with you contemplating on the sufferings of Christ, what they were, why they were necessary, and how we can live in its fellowship, as St. Paul says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the uh, fellowship is suffering, fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, as it says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. The word beska itself can have two meanings. It can refer to the Hebrew pisach, which refers to the Passover of the Israelites. The word Passover is a passing over, a passage from death and salvation granted by God. We see the Lord doing this in two instances with his people. The first was the tenth plague where the Lord would kill every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both animal and human being alike. But he passed over those among the children of Israel who had sacrificed the Passover lamb and marked their doorposts and their lintels with the blood of the lamb. To emphasize the importance of this Passover, the Lord instructed the Israelites to celebrate it every year to remind them how God saved them from death, sealed by the blood of the lamb. In the light of Christ, 
We now understand the Passover to be the blood of Christ himself. As St. Paul says, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. For us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. And so we celebrate our own salvation given to us by the blood of Christ. As St. Peter says, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. 1 Peter chapter 1, 18 through 19. The second type of passing over was the crossing of the Red Sea, where the Israelites faced certain death in their exodus from Egypt. But God saved them with the parting of the sea. The water of the Red Sea represented death, but through God's saving hand now became life and salvation. This again was a type of salvation which works in us through baptism, as St. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 2. So there is a clear connection between death and life. Just as baptism is, buried, is being buried with him into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of his Father, even so we should walk into the newness of life. Romans chapter 6, verse 1. But Passover can have a different meaning as well. The word Pascha might also come from the Greek word patin, meaning to suffer. While this is probably not the more accurate understanding of the word, and was not adopted by many Eastern fathers, such as St. Gregory the Theologian, St. Cyril of Alexandria in origin, the concept became popular more in the Western tradition. Melito, who was a second bishop in the city of Sardis, the same city we hear about in Revelation chapter 3, verse 1, also draws the connection between suffering and this week. It's also why many people call this week the Passion Week, focusing on Christ's passion or suffering. The point here, of course, is not to debate whether Pascha means more Passover or Passion, but instead to show that the early church, even in the early church, the Passion of our Lord was a clear focus during this week. Did Christ really suffer? Perhaps we take this for granted now, but this was actually a hotly debated topic for almost 700 years in the early church. Even during the time of the apostles, many early believers could not really grasp the divinity of Christ, and what it meant for him to suffer or even taste death. The early, the early church battled those who thought that Christ was a mere apparition, not real flesh. St. John the Evangelist insisted that the word was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled. 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. Christ was not a ghost but was a real person whom the apostles touched and therefore really suffered as a person, physically, emotionally, spiritually. Then Arius, of course, comes along and challenged whether Christ was really God. How could he be God if he suffered and died? But the church, as we all know, insisted on the full and true divinity of our Lord. Therefore, we say in the creed that we believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, who is true God from true God but also that he suffered and was buried. Even patriarchs had a hard time really absorbing this mystery. In the 5th century, Nestorius, who was then the patriarch of Constantinople, thought the divinity could not suffer. And therefore, it was the man, Jesus, who suffered, not the divine logos. He conceived of two persons, or hypostases, conjoined in one prosopon, or mask, that separated the divinity of Christ from the humanity of Christ in order to reconcile what is appropriate for the divinity and what is appropriate for the humanity. Nestorius, for example, found it inconceivable that the divinity, the eternal Logos, the second person of the Holy Trinity, be born of the Virgin in the same way ordinary people are. He famously said, I would not call him who was two or three months old God. Because, because he could not see how God, the creator of the universe, could in reality become a suckling and vulnerable babe. He would say the creature, meaning he or St. Mary, did not bear the creator, but a mere man. And for this reason, he did not prefer the term Theotokos, because that meant St. Mary bore the divinity, which for Nestorius was impossible. Many people believe in stories and still believe it until now, but the Orthodox Church rejected this belief completely. 
St. Cyril of Alexandria insisted on something called the hypostatic union of God and man, meaning here there is no such thing as two persons existing in Christ, but that Christ is one. For St. Cyril, everything Christ did, everything he said, everything he experienced was one reality, and that necessarily meant that God himself did it, said it, and experienced it those things in the flesh, including the suffering on the cross. One of St. Cyril's 12 anathemas, which was endorsed at the Council of Ephesus, was, whoever does not recognize that the word of God suffered in the flesh, that he was crucified in the flesh, and that likewise in that same flesh he tasted death, and that he is become the firstborn of the dead, let him be an anathema. We should pause here and think of the subject of that sentence. It is the word of God, the eternal and immortal Logos, the second person of the Holy Trinity, who was crucified on the cross in the flesh, not just a man. It was the word who cried in agony, the word who wept bitterly with vehement cries and tears, as it says in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7. The word who hungered and thirsted, the word who labored, the word who was mocked and slapped, and the word who tasted death. All this God did in the flesh, not in some sort of conjoined way, attributing the suffering to a man, but the omnipotence to God, as if they happened to coexist in some meeting place called Christ. But it happened in a real, actual, singular way that only really God can understand. The church teaches this in the Greek hymn, of homonogenes, which we sing on the sixth hour of the Great and Holy Friday. There are two traditions associated with this hymn. In our Coptic church, we trace the hymn to St. Severus in the seventh century. But in the Greek church, they associate the hymn with the emperor theologian Justinian, who also in the seventh century, well, was in the seventh century during the time of St. Severus. What's important here is that both traditions, Greek and Coptic, all of orthodoxy, in fact, agree upon this hymn and its Christological importance. So what's so important about this hymn? Listen to what it says. O only begotten Son, eternal, immortal, word of God, who for our salvation accepted all sufferings, who was incarnate of the holy Theotokos and ever Virgin Mary, who without change became man and was crucified, Christ, God, who trampled down death by death, one of the Holy Trinity, who is glorified with the Father and the Holy Spirit, save us. Holy God, who being God for our sake became man, without change, holy mighty, who by weakness show forth what, what is power, holy immortal, who was crucified for our sake and endured death in the flesh, the eternal and immortal. Who is this hymn addressing? Who is the subject of all these sentences? Is it a man? No, it is the only begotten Son of God the eternal, immortal word of God, the second person of the Holy Trinity. It is God himself who was born, who became man, who accepted suffering, who became weak, who was crucified and endured death in the flesh. Our church liturgically emphasizes this point repeatedly, probably to the point where we have become numb to its meaning. In the liturgy, the priest says that in the, in the confession that his body is the life-giving body. The phrase would not make any sense if it just meant a body without a true union with God. Both the priest and the congregation say, we worship your holy body and your honored blood of his Christ, the Almighty, the Lord our God. How can God, who is spirit, who is spirit by nature, have blood that we worship? Or are we worshiping just a human body? Again, this language would not make any sense unless God was truly united with humanity. So we can say that the body of Christ was indeed God's, and therefore the shedding of blood was truly God's. St. Cyril continually pointed to an important text that we should spend this week contemplating. And the Church in her wisdom actually reads this text on Great and Holy Friday on the very hour of Christ's death in the ninth hour. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery 
The Greek word here is arpagmon, which is more uh, something to be grasped, something to hold on to. So he did not consider it something to just hold on to being God, being equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Ik inosin, which means self-emptying. He emptied himself, taking the form of a slave and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has also exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of his Father. We see that Christ Jesus exists in the form of God, and that he somehow emptied himself and took the form of a slave. St. Cyril taught that if the humanity of Christ was the one that suffered and not the divinity, then where is the self-emptying? Where is the humbling of himself and obedience if it was all just outwardly, where the divinity was not himself experiencing these things in actual way? And on account of this obedience, God exalted him. Who is the him? Was it just the divinity that was exalted by God and given the name above all names to which every tongue should confess? There would be nothing unusual about that. And it certainly would not be as a result of any kind of obedience or self-emptying. Rather, the person being on, exalted on account of his obedience and death is Christ Jesus, who is one hypostatic reality, one person, one existence, one inward being of both God and man, a God-man, or a theanthropos, as Origen first coined the term, but it later became popular in the Christological texts of the 6th and 7th centuries. Why is this so important? Or is it just semantics by philosophers with nothing better to do? One of the great things about our church is that our theology is very practical. These are not abstract concepts to be debated, but truths to be lived. How? Suffering is everywhere in our world. One of the inescapable realities of our lives that some even use to disprove the existence of God. They use a syllogism we've all heard before. God exists and is good, then God would not allow suffering because suffering is evil. There is, there, there is suffering in this world, therefore either God does not exist or God is not good. There are, of course, many responses to this false logic, but my favorite one is by a guy called Alvin Platinga, who flipped the syllogism on his head. He said that if God is good, then his nature is also good, and free will is in his nature which means it is good. Free will could choose evil. Otherwise, it would not be free will. And that results in suffering. But that is a consequence of God's goodness, of giving free will. It is not the cause of the suffering. In other words, a world without suffering, because it is just forbidden by God, is not out of his goodness, because then there would be no free will. I mention all this because it sounds as if God is foreign to suffering as if he is in heaven watching our suffering from a distance, as if our suffering was just an unintended byproduct of creation. But that is not the case. God knew from the moment of creation, Adam and Eve would choose disobedience and would bring death and suffering upon not just themselves, but upon all creation. As St. Paul mentions, the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs until now, Romans chapter 8, verse 22. But God had a plan in mind. He would restore humanity himself by becoming a man himself, a real man with a rational soul and not just some image. As God in the flesh, he then takes all our sin, corruption, evil, imperfection, pain and suffering, and he eradicates them, as St. Paul says, having wiped out the handwriting of our sins, the handwriting of our requirements that were against us, which was contrary to us, and took them out of the way, nailing them to the cross. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. For this reason, we also say in the sixth hour of the Ecbeya, and we will repeat it again in the sixth hour of the Great and Holy Friday, O you who was nailed on the cross for the sin of which our father Adam dared to commit in paradise, tear away the handwriting of our sins. Unless God in reality took these things upon himself in a real way, 
uniting them with his divinity, even to the point of tasting death in the flesh, then he would not have completely abolished them, crushing them completely with the power of his divinity. So God's suffering was for us and for our salvation, as we say every day in the creed. His suffering became our comfort. His death became our life. His obedience cured our disobedience. His labor became our rest. His tears became our joy. His nakedness covered our shame. His weakness became our strength. His poverty became our richness. And his humiliation our glory. We notice in the Gospel of St. John that whenever he refers to the cross or the crucifixion, he calls it being lifted up or being glorified. He uses this phrase at least 10 times. So it's not just a poetic verse, but it is a reality. In the Lord's suffering on the cross and in his humiliation, we are lifted up and glorified. St. Athanasius says, this he did out of sheer love, so that in his death all might die, and the law of death be abolished, because having fulfilled in his body that for which it was appointed, it was therefore voided of its power. That's on the Incarnation paragraph. We say in the Wednesday Theotoke of the Midnight Praise, he took what is ours and gave us what is his. What is ours? It is our old nature, weak, corrupted, decaying, suffering, dying. What is his? A new nature, strong, perfect, victorious, vivacious, joyful, and free from death. For this reason, we now have a fellowship in his sufferings, kononian ton patimatum. As St. Paul says, the word fellowship comes from the Greek word kononia in the sense of a participation, a sharing, a communion. St. Luke uses the term kononia as a way of life between the apostles in Acts chapter 2, verse, verse 42. St. Paul uses the same term as a participation in the gospel. He uses it for sharing in the service. He even uses it for receiving the Eucharist in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16. So what, de what does he mean then by having a fellowship in his suffering? We can say it has two meanings. The first rests solely with Christ. In his suffering, because he was truly a man united with God, we all participate. Not in the sense that we were there actually on the cross, but our humanity and our nature suffered when Christ took it upon himself in order to abolish it. In this sense, getting to know him and the fellowship of his suffering means living in Christ's salvation, knowing what he did for us and for our salvation, loving him, being humbled by his care for us, praising him for it. It means enjoying the grace that he gave us in our baptism, being a new creation, as St. Paul says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 15. It means not staining ourselves again by living in sin and corruption, but by holding fast to the gospel. It means walking in the spirit to escape condemnation, as scripture says in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. This week in particular, we can have fellowship in his suffering by contemplating his suffering for us, specifically meditating upon the praise, thine is the glory. Is it possible that thine is the glory can also be for ourselves in Christ if we have fellowship in his suffering? Can we also draw power in his weakness through our fellowship with his suffering? Are we too blessed in his suffering if we have fellowship? Can we imagine ourselves in majestic union with God himself, even sitting upon his throne, as St. John says in Revelation chapter 3, verse 21? What a great mystery it is to have fellowship with the suffering of Christ. The second meaning rests with ourselves. While we are mournful that our God endure suffering because of our condition, we are also joyful because he suffered. We hold his suffering before us as the most precious thing we can ever have, and we find great comfort in it. His suffering transforms our own suffering into joy, and therefore we are very happy to know his suffering better and better. St. Paul says, for as the suffering of Christ abounds in us, so our comfort also abounds through Christ. His Holiness Pope Shenouda said that God does not take away suffering from this world even after the cross, but instead he changes suffering into joy for those who have fellowship with his suffering.
In fact, this joy and comfort and suffering becomes contagious and benefits not just ourselves, but those around us. As the Apostle Paul says, God comforts us in all tribulations, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4. How amazing that in Christ we can actually use suffering in this world to spread God's comfort. May the Lord our God bless our journey through this great and holy Vesca, enjoying the fellowship of his suffering and leading us to the power of his holy resurrection. And glory be to our God forever. Amen.